Good morning. Good morning, sir. This is June 7th, 1999 in Maydick, Massachusetts. This is part of the Morris Institute Library Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. Uh, may I ask what your name is, please? John Peter Rossi. Rossi, would you spell that, please? Uh, R-O-S-S-I. Thank you. And your address, John? Natick, Mass. Are you married? Yes, I am. And may I ask what your age is, please? 77. And do you have children? Yes, I do. Boy and a girl. All grown up. <laughs> yeah. All over the part of the country here. <laughs> Where are they, John? Uh, one is in the close by, which is Framingham, and the other is out on the west coast, Seattle, Washington. That's about as far as you can get. About as far as you can get, right up to Puget Sound. Do you have grandchildren? Yes, I have two. One boy and the one girl. Well, you're a family man, <laughs> a yes, native yeah. man. Yes, I am. Uh, where, where were you born? I was born in Boston, and then we moved out to Natick here, and I've lived in Natick all my life. Uh, how, how, could, how did you come to, come to Natick from Boston? Well, let's see. My mother and father got married in Boston, and when I was born, I think they stayed a couple of years in Wellesley, and then mm -hmm. we moved to Natick because of the schools. Uh, there were schools were very excess close to our home, and that's the reason we came to Natick, and uh, we've enjoyed it. Do you know sense. about what time they moved to Natick, or what time you were conscious of being in Natick? I would say 1922 or 23, around there. I'm not fully sure, but in that era. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're a townie, yeah, by I definition. Guess, I guess so. You're really a townie. Yes. Can you tell us something about your, your family background? What did your father do? What did your mother do? Well, my mother and father came from Italy. When they came to this country, my father was a molder. He would mold uh, a different object in sand for uh, steel in order to, uh, oh, what would I say, when they melt the steel down, form parts mm -hmm. for different machinery. And my mother was just a house worker, a little seamstress. She would do now and then, that's all. Yeah. So you were a school kid in Natick. Yes, I was a school kid. Uh, you went to what school? I went to uh, the two room school up in North Natick. And then I went to the Felchville School. And then I went to the junior high. And then I went to the high school, which is now torn down. And oh, that's yeah. graduated from <laughs> yeah. there. Yeah. Graduated in 1940. You graduated from high school in 1940. Uh, there had been a war started in Europe in 1938. Yes. Can you remember what it was like to get out of high school and know that, in one sense, war was in the air? Well, I had it in my mind, and I always said, well, you never know. We might get involved in this, you know? And uh, at that time, the minute I graduated, my buddy and I, we were taking flying lessons at Gould's Airfield, and we were going in for commercial airline pilots. I did receive a pilot's license, but that's as far as I went, because uh, this war was getting close and everything was being interrupted, and I knew that the draft was coming along, so we couldn't pursue it any further. This was 1940? 1940. 1940, yes. Okay, so then we passed something called December 7th, 1941. Mm -hmm. uh, were you in the military at that time No, yet? I wasn't, no. Okay. I went in in October. 1942, I was drafted. Okay. And I went into Fort Devens. From Fort Devens, I went on from there. All right. My question was to be when and where did you enter the military? You joined the army. Well, I was drafted and drafted. went to the army, and uh, we went to Fort Devens. That's where we uh, started off. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I took basic training in Jefferson Barracks, Missouri. And that was a regular hellhole there, but it was very, very strict. And uh, from there, we came up to Westover Air Base, and that's when we got attached to the 5th Air Corps, which was out of Westover Air Base. And uh, uh, let's see. Can we back up just a second sure. here? You're, f you're flying now. I'm not uh, flying. But you're in the Air Corps. I'm in, attached to the Air Corps, okay. yes. Okay. Um, when you went into the service, uh, did other guys from Natick go in with you? Yes. Friends or family? Yes. Uh, I had one very close buddy uh, from school. His name was Donald Sloper. And I haven't seen him in 55 years. I know he's living in Walpole, I think. 
and hope he's still alive. Yeah. And uh, we went in together. As a matter of fact, we were in the same outfit together all through the war, which made it very nice. Donald Sloper? Yes, Donald Sloper, school chum of mine. And did he go to Jefferson Barracks with you? Yes, he did. Yeah. Yes, he did, yeah. Okay, now tell us about basic training, this hellhole that you went to. Well, yes, basic training is very, very tough, but they had to do it. In other words, they'll give you six months training in about three months. And uh, you have to catch on very, very quick what's going on. It what did hard. you have? What did what did you have to learn? Uh, well, of course, uh, you learn how to handle your rifle. You have to go in the firing squad with uh, go on the range. A uh, lot of marching so that you could build your body up. And uh, basically, that was his exercises and all. You know, wanted to see how good your stamina was. Mm -hmm. You would have to go through. Uh, chambers with uh, tear gas and uh, learn how to use the gas mask, all that war stuff, really. Were they training you to be a basic infantryman? Well, you could say that because this basic training is more or less due to all this stuff yeah. for actually warfare, you know, hand-to-hand -hand combat. But then I went into another branch after you finish with uh, basic training then they assign you to another branch. You must have taken some kind of tests uh, while you were in training and somebody decided you were a pretty bright guy. Yes, we had a lot of uh, exams that uh, mm -hmm. we had to write different things on paper and all to evaluate what you knew and what you didn't know, you know. So did you stand out outside the barracks one morning and they said you're off to uh, the Air Corps? Well, they said uh, Originally, that was the interpretation I got. I was going to the Air Corps at Westover Air Base. But the story was that they needed some airborne engineers right away. So they put me and a bunch of other fellows who were disappointed at that time because we wanted to get into the Air Corps itself to fly planes. We landed up as engineers, but we still were with planes because we were attached to the 5th Air Corps out of Westover Air Base. It wasn't what I really wanted, but I made the best of it, and I was still with planes anyway, so they were all around me. What kind of planes were these? Uh, C-47s, P-38s, B-25 bombers, Mitchell bombers, B-24s, uh, Liberator, Flying Fortresses, P-51s, you name it, we had them all over there. And did you, as an engineer, Yes. What did you, what were your duties? My duties, and they trained me on it, was a demolition man. I was to uh, use explosives to blow up sides of mountain or coral, and we would use that coral to lay airstrips overseas for our fighters to come in. As soon as we got the fighters in, then we went ahead with the heavy equipment and made great big airfields field, out of it. Was this dangerous work? You're yes, dealing with ex explosives? Was yes, any, it was. Did you know of anybody hurt? Were you hurt? I wasn't hurt, thank God. Oh, I think some fellas might have got hurt. And my outfit was very fortunate, thank the good Lord. And no one got hurt. It is a dangerous situation. You just had to know what you're doing. You can't think of what you're going to do tomorrow when you're handling explosives. Where did you learn to, where did you go to blow up things? Uh, to start this explosive bit, we started in the back of Westover Air Base. There was a lot of acreage of land back there. We were able to use heavy equipment to train people to use the heavy equipment and to train people to use explosives. I can't remember all explosives that we used. I know we used dynamite. And then we had another explosive that was in a square block that uh, the only way you could fire that is with electrical caps. And that's where we learned to use the ex Explosive. Right. Now, did you tell us the, the, the outfit that you were assigned to? Uh, it was A-72nd Airborne Engineers. We would fly along with the equipment on the C-47 cargo planes, which actually went a lot of the war because they were very good transport planes. We would haul miniature equipment on the C-47s, land in fields, even if we had a crash land, that was the whole thing of it, and get this little equipment out, and we'd start the airstrip immediately. 
And as soon as we got the fighter planes in, then the other heavy equipment would be shipped in by boat and uh, the operators would start in and make the big airfields that we use for our bombers and fighters. You mentioned C-47s. Yes. Is that the DC-3 uh, yes. converted yes. into a passenger plane? Yes. So C where did you go from Westover? From Westover, we went to Maxton, North Carolina to get used to flying on gliders. The C-47 was able to tow gliders overhead, even with a, one small piece of equipment, and then detach from the C-47. And we either had a crash land or any small field we found, we'd go in there. It was dangerous because a lot of times you don't know if you're really going to crash land or, or come out safe, even flying into a small field. So you actually flew in gliders towed behind the DC, the exactly, C-47. Yes. yes. Tell us about what it's like to get into a glider. I didn't like it, to tell you the truth. Well, it's kind of dangerous work, it isn't is, it? It is, yes. Uh, to be real frank, I never flew in the glider, but I was scheduled to go, mm. but there were other people ahead of me that went, and I said, well, let them go anyway, you know. You may be lucked out. I was lucked out on that one. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it was. I'm just told that TND was the name of the block. Yes, I think <laughs> you're right. You're right. Okay, that's great. Yeah. We got experts here. Yeah. <laughs> in North Carolina, what, did you yeah. get additional training in explosives? Yes, we did a little more exploding there and uh, learned how to crawl under barbed wire and all that if they really needed us into the combat because sometimes they would uh, use us to go and patrol overseas, you know. And uh, then from North uh, Carolina, we went over to San Francisco and took a ship to go overseas. We first landed in New Zealand for three days, the most beautiful country I ever saw. Then from there, we went into Australia, stayed in Australia for about a month. We visited Brisbane and Townsville, just getting equipment ready to go up into New Guinea. And then after the uh, 28th day, we all boarded a ship and we flew into Port Moresby, New Guinea. And that was the beginning of a lot of things that I don't like to okay. really get into. Let me ask you, um Back in North Carolina, and I was uh, Sloper still with you? Yes, he was. And was he with you throughout the whole went, war? Yes, was. Was there was. anybody else? In, were you part of a cohesive unit? Yes. Uh, Donald Sloper, uh, being a Natick man, he was the, uh, the clerk in headquarters, I think. And, uh, but we were together, and we saw each other all the time, which made it nice. We kept talking about Natick, kept wishing we were back in a good old Natick. Yeah. You're, what you're telling us is that you were, and you were trained to be an infantryman if necessary. If necessary, you right. You were an engineer yes. working, preparing fields, yes. and you were working with planes, and yes. that you were making it possible for planes to come in. That's right. Were you attached to MacArthur's outfits? We were under his command. Yeah. Yes, we were all under his command. So you were going up. Uh, up the coast of New Guinea. Yes. Uh, as and with the Seventh Fleet. Is that correct? Well, probably was. Yes. Yeah. We landed in many places there. All right. We flew into a lot of places from Port Moresby. We flew into a place called Silly Silly. It sounds funny, but that's the name of this place. It was more or less of a resting place to give us a little rest before we really got into the hard work of things. Then from Silly Silly, we flew into. Uh, place called uh, Goosap. Mm -hmm. Goosap was a big field in between mountains. In other words, it's like a big flower bowl, and uh, that's where we had to build the airstrip. And there was mountains all around us. Then how, how did you fly in? We flew in with C-47s into a very rough field. Okay. And, uh, luckily, we didn't crash. They made it all right, because uh, a lot of those places had a lot of potholes from Japanese bombers who dropped daisy cutters on there to make holes in there so we wouldn't get in there, but we did get in there. You were part of a campaign then leapfrogging up the coast of New exactly. Guinea, which would cut off Japanese That's right. and go around them and yes. build air fields in front of them That's right. so they could be attacked behind you. That's it. Um, what kind of equipment could you bring in in a C-47? That's not a pretty right. big plane. A small bulldozer that would be enough to, uh, 
excavate the dirt. You get enough of those in, you can get a, a strip going. We brought in graders, small rollers, things like that. And as soon as we got the strip pretty well started, heavy equipment would come in by boat and go through the jungles and whatnot and come to our sprayer strip. And uh, most of our men took over the heavy equipment and uh, went ahead and built these big airfields. The Goosehead was a very big airfield, a big one. I never forgot that place. At any time when you got out of your C-47, did you have to fight your way out no, or prepare the field? No, we didn't have to fight field? our way out, but we had to watch out for bombers and strafing. And uh, one morning when we had the field just about completed, I'll never forget, it was about 10 o'clock in the morning, Jab Zeros thought that we didn't have ACAC -AC guns on that field. They got surprised because a few days before, Betty Bombers would be overhead photographing the field and the amount of work that we have done. So that morning, about 10 o'clock, 13 Jab Zeros caught us with a pants down, actually, on this field. And if it wasn't for the ACAC -AC guns, they'd have done a number on us. My buddy and I found a small gully we just dropped. That's all you can do in the strafing. And you could hear all the bullets flying around us. And we kept saying, the next one, the next one, the next one, meaning the next one, it's ours, that's it. And luckily, uh, they buzzed over, but as they was trying to make a second pass to get us, the ACAC -AC guns opened up, and not one of those Jab Zeros ever got back to Tokyo. They shot down 13 they planes? They shot down 13 planes there, and that sky looked like polka dots from the ACAC -AC guns that shot them. I think some of the ACAC -AC guns did get hit, but uh, I felt very, very bad for that. I never forgot that morning. Gasoline drums were flying all over the place. It was a hell. It was hell there for a few hours. And it's really a miracle that I am here today, and I believe in miracles because it was a miracle that day. John, you felt you were going to die that morning? I thought I was going to die, yep. Yeah. I even told Father Toomey here at St. Patrick's Church, the good Lord was with me and my buddy and the rest of them that morning. I'll never, never forget that. It was horrible. Yeah. Did you take part in uh, firing back at the planes? No, I didn't. I did all I could do to just stay quiet and pray. That's all. That's all all of us could do. Well, evidently it worked. It worked. It certainly yeah. did. Can you tell us approximately when that was? I don't remember. I don't remember, but I can see it as plain as day. How far up the island were you about that time? I would estimate maybe halfway up the island. I may be wrong, but roughly. I think we were halfway up the island there. Because uh, up above that, I think you'd come to Dubradora, Madang, Kayapit. We were below that. So I, I would say roughly halfway up the island. I'm not fully sure. Have you looked at maps recently to see where you were? Uh, no, but I have a friend that I've met from the VFW in Sudbury. He's a historian. And he has maps of New Guinea and all, and he's going to bring them down to my home someday to look at. And he, believe it or not, was the control man in the control tower in Goosap, New Guinea, where we built that strip. And I only ran into him about six months ago, and I haven't seen him for 55 years. What was his name? Uh, I'm trying to think of his name now. Give me a minute. That's OK. You will. Uh, I'm just impressed that you could sit here yeah. after all these years and name the towns and yes. places yes. that you might not have thought of for a long time. I know it. Yeah. What yeah. happened after the raid? Now, you, you guys after had been raid, bombed yeah, out or yeah, yeah, strafed after, out. Yes, after the raid, we repaired all the field again because they dropped a few daisy cutters. Daisy cutters are the uh, smaller bomb, the personal bomb. They, uh, uh, the shrapnel explode from them, and they only get as high as a daisy flower itself. Mm -hmm. And it goes along the ground. That's how they kill personal troops. But uh, and we repaired the field and kept going on from there. Then after that, we uh, all boarded up on our planes, and we flew into uh, the Philippines. OK, stop right there. All right. I'm going to go back to San Francisco. Mm -hmm. You shipped out as a unit. Yes. 
and you knew guys on board and Sloper was with you. Yes. Did you know where you were going? No, not really. And where no. did you, what's, what's the we first place you landed? in uh, Stoneham, San Francisco, which was a base uh, with all military personnel, and from there you would get the orders to where you would be going. Yes, but we but from but when you sailed out of San Francisco Bay, did you know where you were going? No, no, I didn't know. No. When did you find out? Well, when we were about three quarters of the way through the ocean, <laughs> we found out we were going to land in New Zealand first to drop off some equipment. We yeah. only stayed there three days. That is a beautiful country. And then after three days, we sailed off to Australia. Northeast Australia, yeah, Brisbane. Northeast, Brisbane, yeah. 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 And, uh, we stayed there for about half a month or so, uh, getting more supplies in and uh, getting ready to go up with the big pushers in New Guinea. Was there uh, any training at these places to, no. to keep your hand in, you know, with the no, explosives no and all of that? No, we had no training there at all. No, we just did light duty yeah. around our own perimeter until we got the word to pack up and. So you finish. sailed again. Yes, out we of sailed there. again. And then, and you were on your way, yes, really, we were this on time. Yes, on way. Yes. Yep. That's the, oh, the, over to Fort Moresby from there? Yeah. Fort Moresby? We, we landed at Fort Moresby. Yeah. And I think we stayed there for about almost two months. Yeah. We were doing light work there and uh, just to get ready to go up further, to get the okay to uh, go up and build the airstrips. As you went through these experiences um, and moved around a lot, how did you keep in touch with where you were and relative to the big picture? I don't know, it's confusing sometimes, to tell you the truth. And uh, we were never told when we were going to go from one place to another yeah. until we get the orders, see. Once we're on the plane or wherever, then we'd get the orders of where we were going to go. Because so many of our outfit also went to a couple of other different places to build the airstrips too. They sort of uh, split us up for a mm, few days and all to get this equipment into other spots to start airfields. Did you have any, uh, did you get any news of what else was happening in the Pacific? What was Halsey doing at this time? Nimitz? No, we didn't. Not really. We pick up maybe once in a while through shortwave radio, some little incident, but we didn't. Uh, you paid Paid, paid attention, attention to staying to alive. Yeah, we paid attention to watching up for our own skin. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I interrupted you a minute ago. Uh, where did you go after you left the island? That uh, after we left New Guinea, yeah, we went into uh, the Philippines, a town called Palo Alto, and we stayed in the Philippines oh a few months. What were you doing there? In there, we helped them with the near strip that was there, and we also built some roads there for the town because they got bombed out too. There. What island so was this on? Was this Luzon? This was uh, no, no, the Philippine itself. Uh, the uh, island of Leyte. Leyte. Leyte, and the town was Palo Alto, and we helped build some roads there to get them started. Then from there, uh, which was not too long, we shipped to another place called. Uh, Lady, not lady, uh, boy, that's... You say you, tapey. You, you shipped, you, you sailed again? Yes, we sailed from uh, Lady up further on the coast to a place called Atape, A-T-A-P-E, something like that. And uh, we did the same thing there, helped them build some roads and whatnot. Helped who? The Philippines. Okay, the Philippine, Philippine army is this? Uh, the people and the, the yeah. community and whatnot. They used us there for the time being. And then from there, we got word that uh, we're going into Okinawa. So we boarded ship again on LSTs and we headed for Okinawa. And that was a, a hot hole there we went in. That was April 1st, 1945. I'm not sure of the dates. I can't remember the dates. That was D-Day for Okinawa. Yeah, it was. All right. So I think we pulled in there four or five days after that. And uh, that was an anthill, as, as you know. There was two Okinawas. They were all dug in. And uh, we had captured two Japanese there, my outfit. 
And through the interpreter, we found out they had started building those tunnels to uh, have war with the United States 14 years ago, believe it or not. They had to because those tunnels were so deep and so far in the mountains, you just couldn't believe it unless you were there. Tell us about the tunnels, uh, how you came to find them or, or uh, well, how, how we you found came all to these use tunnels, them. Yeah. When the uh, infantry and whatnot landed on the shore, they would be firing guns and whatnot from all these tunnels they had in there. See, they, they had cannons and machine guns and you name it, bazookas. And uh, they, had, they had an upper hand on us when the poor boys went in there, I'll tell you. How did you get ashore? Uh, we landed with LSTs. You didn't because, fly into this no, place? No, we didn't no. fly in. We landed yeah. on LSTs. We were attacked in the harbor, but luckily no ship was hit. It was just a quick attack from some Betty Bomber. And then uh, we went right into the harbor and we set up camp. And there we uh, built a lot of airstrips and repaired a lot of strips in Okinawa. And one particular strip is called Naha. It's about one or two feet above water level, actually, to the ocean. It's very, That's very. It's the capital low. city, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And uh, I understand today it's a tourist attraction there, believe it or it's not. Is that right? Yeah. I met uh, one of our uh, chaplains, I think it was. He flew back there many years after the war, and he said that place is a tourist attraction. They still have guns and some of the revetments there for people to see who went over mm -hmm. there. But the Naha Airstrip is still there. Of course, it's all built, all modern now, because when we were there, it was nothing but an old banged up strip. But you helped to build it. We helped to repair it so our bigger planes could come in because the Japs had bombed and made all potholes all over the place, you know. You can't land with a lot of potholes there. So we repaired them. You were in New Guinea. Yes. Um, you were in the Philippines. Yes. Now you were on Japanese territory, yes. that is Okinawa. Yeah. D did the military prepare you for the cultural differences you were facing? There's these three different cultures that you've gotten to yes, so far. Yes, I know. Do you have any training in that direction? No, not really. No, we didn't. No. No. Sometimes it would take us a certain squad of our unit and we'd have to go on patrol, look out for snipers or whatnot, you know, just to protect our own area to make sure they will not come in, you know, because they had the habit at night that they would sneak in, you know, and attack men right in the tent. So you changed hats again. Now you're an, an infantryman right protecting the, the strips. It yeah. was a little infantry work that we were doing. Yeah. 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 We didn't like that too much, that's for sure. Were any of your friends uh, killed in combat? I. Or in these raids that you suffered through? I don't remember. Uh, most of the boys and myself, we got sick over there pretty bad. There's malaria mm -hmm. and dengue fever. I had the dengue fever three or four times. And that's bad. It's as bad as malaria. Only with malaria, when you're over in the States, you will get a reoccurrence. But with the dengue fever, you won't get a reoccurrence. But it leaves you uh, kind of weakish, like, like this hot weather that we have now. I can feel my system being a little bit weakish. You were laid up with dengue fever. Yes. Did you get good medical attention? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. They were very good. We had good medics. And I think I went in the hospital about three different times with dengue fever. Yeah. And is it recurrent for you now? No. Just uh, you just feel bad yeah, on a day like this. Yeah, I feel weak on hot, hot days. But the malaria is the one that sometimes you have reoccurrence. That's what you want to watch out for. I didn't have the malaria. I had Were you taking any kind of pills? Uh, yes, the we used to take, Yes, we took Adabrin all the time that we're there. Mm -hmm. And that uh, you take Adabrin every day, it makes your skin kind of yellowish. You know. They were lousy pills to take, but it saved you from uh, malaria and whatnot. Am I correct that we're up to 45 and you're in big trouble again? Yes. Uh, did you ever get home after you went into the service? You mean on a furlough yeah. or something? No. You never no. did? No. From 42 to 45, you'd been in, in the service? Yes, I've been in the service. And never got home? Never got home, no. Were you in touch with folks at home? Yes, I would write to my mother uh, and my father. Uh, I would have to write in Italian because my mother didn't understand English too well. And I had to go before a board and swear that I wasn't giving out any information because we didn't have no any 
interpreters over there yeah. that would interpret Italian, you know. So I had to go before a board and tell them that I'm not giving away any secrets and whatnot. So to pass the censor, you had to swear to what was in the exactly, letter. Exactly, yeah, exactly, yeah. A lot of letters that uh, they did get, or some of my friends got back home, it was all torn up anyway because it was censored, you know. Mm -hmm. I must have said something without realizing it, but every serviceman has, I know that. Somebody had sharp scissors. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I'd like I, to try them out. <laughs> I know Kanawa, if you got up to Naha, uh, yes. you must have seen a lot of, uh, did you, I'm not going to say you saw, but did you see the kamikazes? Could you see them attacking ships? I saw a kamikaze one time as we were heading, I think, with Hokanawa on a boat, and uh, we had American ships guiding the convoy to go into Okinawa, and the kamikaze got very low in the water. He gets very low, so our ships can't fire because it would hit our own ships. So these kamikaze would get very low in the water, and then they'll take their pick. Shall I go left or right? And they'll just go into a ship. But evidently, they got this fellow before he made any decision, so he just went in the drink, and that was it. And you saw that? I saw that. <clears throat> Did you see any uh, aerial activity over your head? Oh, yes. When we got into Okinawa, uh, we were being uh, bombed, and uh, Jap Zeros were trying to strafe us to a while, the L while we were on the LSTs. We hadn't got into land yet, but there's another case, <laughs> thank the good Lord. Yeah. And wearing your other hat, you could identify all the airplanes. So when something came by, yes. you know it's yes. a Corsair or an yes. F6F yes. or whatever. Yeah. yeah, you learn that, uh, which are zeros, which are Tibetan bombers, which are our own planes, or which are our own planes. But uh, there was a funny, well, it was not really a funny incident, but a strange incident when I, I'm backing up now to Gusap, New Guinea again. Uh, one morning, there was a bunch of uh, B-25s, our own boys flying low overhead, and we were waving at them, and all of a sudden, there were bombs being dropped on the field. We couldn't figure out. We kept yelling, hey, we're Americans, what are you doing? And come to find out, they didn't release the bombs. There were Betty bombers way overhead, and they were dropping daisy cutters, and none of them hit the B-25s, but they landed on our field, and we thought they were shooting at us, and they weren't. Luckily, no one got hurt. Do I understand that the Japanese were trying to knock down the Mitchells, the, the B-25s, B by dropping daisy cutters they through the going, formation? Yeah, and none of them hit the, <laughs> hit the uh, B-25s at all. There was quite a few B-25s going over. I don't know. The good Lord was with them there, too. And, and with you, because you, you we were, were on the, the ultimate we recipient. They were firing at us, and they weren't firing at us, see? They were going up ahead to Kayapit, Dubadora, way up there to bomb them up there, see? And those Betty bombers were overhead so far up in the air that you couldn't spot them. That's an amazing story. It certainly is. Yeah, it certainly is. You're up to... Um, about the middle of April in 1945, mm -hmm. at this point, was there any thought in your mind that you still had to go to Japan, something like that? At that time there, all units were alerted that we were supposed to, everybody, head into Japan. And uh, luckily, because of the A-bomb, we saved a lot, a lot of American boys, let me tell you, they had to drop that. Because if they didn't, three quarters of the men would never, never come back, never. Because they were prepared for us. So right after, when that happened, uh, we packed up and uh, they were signing the treaty, I guess the next day, and we were ordered to leave uh, Okinawa and fly in into uh, Japan, and we landed into the Atsugi Air Base in Japan, which was just below Yokohama. And uh, we stayed there more or less to make sure nothing was going to start erupting and whatnot. This was an air base where uh, they had a lot of experimental equipment. They were testing our equipment because I went down below in some of the caves, and they had uh, all our airplane parts. There were trying out and uh, experimenting with. They had our engines down there from uh, 
uh, planes. So they had a lot of stuff on us that uh, they were studying. This captured American equipment? Captured American equipment. You just used the word caves again now. Are, are there caves in Japan too? Uh, well, I wouldn't say. There were some caves. The most of the caves were in the Okinawa. And uh, my job was to go in there and blow up some of these caves so Japanese snipers wouldn't get back in at night and try to attack our boys, you know. And I saw a lot of things in these caves that I really don't want to get into. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm going to take you back into the caves, not to ask you a, no. a question, okay. but specifically, was it so, were the caves so numerous or large that it was tough to blow them all up, or did, did, yes. you were just sealing some of them we off? We were sealing only some of them off because yeah. there were numerous caves. There were, one cave would leave to another, just like ant hills. That's what it was. We called Okinawa the ant hill. There were so many caves all over the place. You couldn't keep up with them. So we would uh, go in there and go in, uh, oh, maybe uh, two or three hundred feet in some of these caves and set explosives mm -hmm. to blow them up so that the enemy wouldn't get back in there at night. Sometimes they would sneak there at night. Oh, my. And, yeah, it was tough. Yeah. Can you remember specifically the day when uh, you heard about something called an atomic bomb? I don't remember that too well, but I know it was released, and uh, I really don't remember. Your reaction anything. to the thought that maybe the war might, might be, be over? Might be over, yes. Yeah. Of course, uh, though, let's see. Then the, uh, the war was over. We were still in Okinawa when the war was over. We heard that it was over. And that was a bigger surprise for everybody. And uh, every piece of artillery was firing that day when we heard the war was over. Everything was going on in the air that you had to run in a foxhole and watch out for our own bullets and shrapnel, you know. Then finally, uh, they got an order from the high command to stop immediately because some of our boys were going to get killed, you know. And the war was over. That was a very, very happy day. The war was over, and yet the next day you take off for yes, Japan. Yes, we took off for what Japan. What were your feelings about that? Well, in a way, I wanted to see what this place looked like to yeah. begin with. And uh, we were at the Satsuki Air Base for uh, about a month. And uh, we got a few days off. We were able to get the gang together on a truck and start up Mount Fujiyama, believe it or not, which is the symbol of Japan there. And we could only get up so far because the air would get so thin that uh, the trucks wouldn't, the carburetors <laughs> wouldn't work good, so we had to quit. And I did see a lot of American villas and whatnot up through the mountains that were beautiful. It is a beautiful, beautiful country. I went into Tokyo, and that was flattened out like a pancake, of course. And uh, we were able to look at that, and uh, one day we uh, got off and we went in the, these underground tunnels, like there was something like uh, your uh, MTA in Boston, where they have trains. The, the subway that. system. Subway system. Yeah. And they had all machine shops where they were making all parts, detonators for bombs and all. So to me, it looked to me like it was a second Tokyo, one underground and one above the ground. You know? But our boys did a wonderful job there. How about you meeting Japanese uh, and they meeting you? Well, i uh, tell you. When we got into Japan, we were told to take our Air Corps insignias off if we went in town because a lot of the women there who had flyers and sweethearts and all, they didn't like us very well. They would actually come try to come to attack us. So we went all in there as a group without our insignias on there. Uh, some Japanese were pretty good. The average person, low-income family, they were glad to see us in there. They didn't want any more war. They wanted to finish this stuff, you know. And uh, those people were all right. They're good workers and all. Uh, we were guarding the airstrip so to f make sure no one would get in there and try to fool around. So you're, you're infantry again? Right now, we're yeah. more yeah. or less like infantry. So yeah. it was from infantry to airborne engineers. Yeah. We had yeah. to play that part. That's, That's what you're trained with. Every outfit is trained for infantry anyway, regardless what you were in, even pilots. They were trained for infantry work also, just in case they had to use them. 
Now, right after your arrival, uh, did American planes start coming in? Yes, we went in, we landed in there early morning, around four o'clock in the morning, and we had American planes come in, and uh, they brought in supplies and whatnot, and uh, yeah, we had American personnel come in there, fly in, yeah. So I stayed there at Tsugi Air Base for about a month. Then I went to, a Tsu uh, and then I went to uh, Yokohama, and took a, took a boat there when I heard I had enough points to come back to the United States, and that sounded so good. And we took a boat out of Yokohama and come back into Frisco. You sailed all the way from Yokohama to San Francisco. Yeah. How long did that take you? It took about a week. We went up towards the Aleutian Islands, this troop ship, and then came back down that way. Yeah, it was quite a, quite a, experience. You've told us of uh, a wonderful story here today. I wonder if you could sort through and think of what was the most memorable experience that uh, came out of this, one that pops into your mind more than anything else. You mean a more dangerous experience? No, not or? necessarily, but something that uh, if you had to sum up the whole thing, this was the thing you remember the most. I think the best part, when we heard the war was over, really, everybody's uh, spirits grew back again, and everybody started to think straight again, like, what are we going to do when we get back to the States and all this, but that was a hard part to get back to the States and get acclimated to, you know, your society back here again. That was hard. It was hard for me, and I think a lot of us were balled up for quite a while, which is a natural thing anyway. And little by little, you get used to it, and things come back to you. I just wanted to get back to good old Natick. What were your feelings about coming home? Were, were, uh, were you well received uh, as a, a veteran of World War yes, II? Yes, yes. Uh, you know that in other words, we've not done so well. Yeah, in I know. Yes, we were well received. I was a little leery coming back to face society. But all veterans have felt that way, you know. It's inside of you, and you wonder how people are going to take you when you do come back. But I was very well received. Where were you discharged? Uh, from Fort Devens. Just about discharged. back where you started. Uh, exactly, <laughs> back where I started. Same month, October, I went in, and October, three years later, I come out of Devens. Uh, how important to you was serving in the United States military? Well, it was important because it was our country. And I'm very patriotic about it. And I just hope that they do not cut down our offense sta defense stations that we have here in America. We should be building them up and not get caught with our pants down again like we did on December 7th, 1941. A lot of people are opposed to not doing that, but you should realize there are other countries that got our eyes on us, and we should be so strong that, that we'd be afraid of attacking. But personally, can I say? Uh, when you remember being in in such an extensive military uh, part of your life, has it affected the rest of your life in any way? Well, in one way, like I said, when I first went in, when uh, we were studying to be commercially aligned pilots, it disrupted that. I wanted to uh, continue that. But when I got home, it took me a while to get used to society again. And things changed over three years, so I gave up uh, learning to become a co commercially aligned pilot, and I ended up getting married. So. Uh, that's no life for a commercially aligned pilot. You're flying around here and there and you're never mm -hmm. home anyway, so I let it go. But I still love, love airplanes. I'm crazy about them. And uh, believe it or not, Howard Balkum, who is a very good friend of mine from school, and myself and other members, we belong to an aircraft club. And what we do now, as old men, as you might say, we fly radio control models. We have a field and we have a ball. We get out there with the old timers, and if it's too windy and we can't fly our planes, we sit there, chew the fat, go over some war experiences, and probably have a drink of beer now and then, 
and have lunch and go back home. <laughs> <laughs> Is there one thought or one memory that you would like to share with us, with your family, but with people who are going to be looking at this tape 50 years from now? Is there something above and beyond that you'd like to tell us? I just hope that they never, never have to get into this situation again. Appreciate it very much. All right. You've Thank offered you us a much. lot to It was to my think pleasure about. talking to you. It's my pleasure. I hope that I said everything that you'd like to hear.